Capitol. Things they're debating. Eric Engberg has the story. There was plenty of elbow room in Magdeburg, East Germany today. Its people were gone, 50 miles down the road to Helmstadt, West Germany, indulging their newfound right to give capitalist materialism a whirl. It's very nice to see it, to see the West, the Golden West. In Leipzig, center of anti-communist foment, there were signs all this sightseeing and shopping was taking some of the pressure off the beleaguered government. Between five and 10,000 people showed up for a rally demanding free elections. That was far short of expectations. In Berlin, things went more smoothly than last week. East Germans left their cars at the border, turning the once fearsome wall into a humble parking lot. The visitors jammed the streets and stores, mostly looking, often in wonderment. West German businessmen like Klaus Engeln, sales manager for a large department store chain, worry the East German crush will hurt business during the lucrative Christmas season. Christmas is traditionally the strongest profit-making time of the year. We make 25% of our yearly profit in the last six weeks. That's why it's so important for us that it goes without a problem. East Berliners can't afford big-ticket items. West Berliners who can are being scared away from the stores. The huge income difference between East and West is an economic barrier just as daunting as the wall. An old German drinking song, sung today in Helmstadt, asks, who can pay? Who has the money? West Germans are now asking that question as they contemplate the next steps in their unfolding relationship with the East. Eric Engberg, CBS News, West Berlin. News in election year 1990 begins with a primary day bang Tuesday in Texas. Lots at stake. The Lone Star State has heavy influence on national and presidential politics, and this time the governor gets a big say in congressional redistricting because of the 1990 U.S. Census. The political impact could last for years. Correspondent Eric Engberg looks tonight at a woman in trouble, sky-high campaign spending, and down-and-dirty politics in the Texas mud. To start, the Texas governor's race has a cast of bigger-than-life characters that includes a well-known grandmother and an oil millionaire. Typically Texan, it's also the first and the costliest primary this year, and it's about as peaceful as a Ewing family reunion. Maddox and White, the worst resumes money can buy. Dan, you know better than what you're saying on television. You know it's a lie. On your worst day, you're better than what you've been doing in this campaign. How nasty is it? A twist, I guess you'd say, on Bush's thousand points of light. We've almost had a thousand points of darkness. On the Democratic side, State Treasurer Ann Richards was the early favorite based on her keynote bush bashing in Atlanta. But she had no magic one-liners to halt questions about her past that have dominated the campaign in recent days. Richards, who speaks proudly of her recovery from alcoholism, refused to say if she had ever used illegal drugs. When you get treatment for your addiction, you put the past behind you and you have an opportunity to begin anew. She has not handled it uh, very well, and it has hurt her, no question about that. Talk about drug use was just a couple of steps further down Mean Street in a race that had already featured ads on who was better at executing criminals. Attorney General Maddox? He's carried out 32 death sentences. Or ex-Governor White. Only a governor can make executions happen. I did, and I will. As Richard's lead slipped, she ditched the cuddly grandmother image her ads conveyed and jumped into the mudslinging contest. I've been sober for 10 years. Have Jim Maddox and Mark White been honest for 10 years? I guess it's possible to imagine a, a meaner and more venal uh, tone to a campaign. But I'm not sure where you're going to find it. I'm sure I don't want to experience it. The Democratic bare-knuckle brawl has only broadened the usually broad smile of Republican Clayton Wheat Williams, the front runner with the Durante profile and the Trump pocketbook. People very broadly like the fact that I'm not a career politician. A total unknown who once led a lobbying charge on the Capitol, Williams has spent $6 million of his own oil, cattle, etc. fortune to sell himself as a crime fighter with homespun cures for drugs. And I'll introduce him to the joys of busted rocks. 
His style appeals to Texans' image of themselves as hardy frontiersmen. How many fistfights have you been in? I haven't been in a fistfight in five years. Political pros think there's a good chance Williams will win the GOP nomination outright on Tuesday, while the Democrats are forced into a runoff with more of the roll around in the mud stuff one candidate bleakly calls cannibalism. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Dallas. New U.S. Supreme Court test of a woman's right to terminate a pregnancy. Correspondent Eric Engberg reports. The vote in the Idaho Senate was 25 to 17 to impose the strictest rules limiting abortion any state legislature has passed since the Supreme Court handed the issue back to the states. The debate was often emotional. If this bill passes, Idaho will be known for and seen as a state where women do not have as many rights as women in other states, that women don't really matter. I don't know how it is that protecting the life of the unborn is any more imposing one's personal beliefs on others than protecting the life of those who are born. The national implications were obvious. It only takes one bill to be passed in one state to threaten the right of all women in this country to make this important decision. The bill, which outlaws abortion as a birth control measure, would ban 95% of abortions now legal in Idaho. They would be allowable in rape cases, but only if the victim had reported the crime within seven days. And in incest cases, only if the victim was under 18. I certainly don't understand everything about abortion, but I do know it's wrong. Backers of the law had a big edge in political savvy and money for ads. This has been the culmination of 15 years of right-to-life politicking in Idaho. Women must decide their fate! After a series of defeats in other state legislatures, anti-abortion activists badly needed a victory somewhere, and Idaho looked like their kind of battlefield. It is among the most Republican of states. Every top elected state official in both parties calls himself pro-life. The Mormon church, which favors tight restrictions on abortion, is politically powerful here. But the fight was still close, thanks to another strong Idaho trait. There's a lot of opposition to government, to any kind of government restrictions of individual activity. And that is a very powerful force in Idaho. The bill is expected to be approved by the governor, setting the stage for a constitutional test. We've carefully crafted it with nine United States Supreme Court justices in mind. But in doing so, we've tried to um, present a direct uh, frontal attack at Roe versus Wade. It could act uh, as the entering wedge for further restrictions on abortion. But the people of Idaho have a chance to change everything. They'll pick a new legislature this year and candidate stands on the abortion bill likely will dominate the campaign. The fight here is just starting. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Boise, Idaho. Still to come. The Navy forced to reopen the USS Iowa investigation. Rising criticism over trade breaks for China and cigarette machines as dealers of death to children. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting again tonight from CBS station KHOU-TV in Houston. Good evening. The U.S. Navy was forced tonight to reopen the investigation into last year's fatal explosion aboard the USS Iowa. The Navy also ordered an immediate halt to firing the big guns aboard all U.S. battleships. This is the first indication. Navy brass may be backing off its insistence that the Iowa blast was deliberate and blaming it on one of the 47 sailors who died in the explosion. From Washington, Eric Ingberg has late details. Eric? The Navy was forced to reopen the Iowa investigation by the most convincing evidence imaginable. A test of the explosive powder of the type used on the Iowa had to be halted today when the powder blew up without warning at a test site in Virginia. The Navy also announced that it had ordered no further firing of the 16-inch guns on the four U.S. battleships until further notice. 47 sailors were killed last year when a horrific explosion tore through one of the Iowa's gun turrets. Among those killed, Clayton Hartwig, a sailor from Ohio. The Navy investigation singled out Hartwig as the likely culprit in the blast, noting that his job on the ship positioned him to sneak a triggering device into the gun breach. For motive, the Navy investigative service said Hartwig had a suicidal personality. Those claims were rejected by Hartwig's friends and family and even questioned by the captain of the ship. 
critics pointed out that Hartwig was a convenient culprit for Navy brass who could not continue using any battleship big guns until the cause was found. Early congressional reaction to today's Navy decision to throw out its earlier findings was angry. So in every way, the, the Navy uh, tried to sweep this under the rug, and I am gratified that they finally have acknowledged that uh, they made some mistakes and are re-evaluating re the entire situation. Today's explosion occurred without injury as the Navy was testing a new theory of non-military U.S. scientists that suggests the Iowa explosion happened by accident rather than sabotage. That theory will be presented to Congress tomorrow. All of this heightens the pressure on the admirals to start all over again. Dan? Thanks, Eric. President Bush, CBS This Morning is sponsored by Coldwell Banker Real Estate, The Home Sellers, a member of the Sears Financial Network. Mikhail Gorbachev has a busy couple days ahead. He'll be spending time at the White House on Capitol Hill at the Soviet Embassy with a side trip to Camp David. CBS News correspondent Eric Enberg has prepared a tour for the Soviet president, a look at another side of our nation's capital. Welcome to Washington, President Gorbachev, but you've caught us at an embarrassing time. Even the tourists are talking. Well, Washington, I think, really has a very bad reputation and uh, it, it's a sad it's a sad thing sorry mr g but the mayor hasn't got time to give you a key to the city his schedule is a little filled these days and i'm excited about uh, all next week having a chance to work on dc government business and going to trial next uh, next month mr. Mr. Mayor. he once led marches chanting up with hope down with dope now the mayor's chief hope is for an acquittal Mr. President, you might remember that Washington's hockey team, the Capitals, visited the Soviet Union last year, but now isn't the time to repay the visit. The Caps have made the unhappy leap off the sports pages onto the police blotter. There was this postseason bash at a local sports bar, after which some of the players had a sexual encounter in the alley with a 17-year-old girl. A grand jury is now the referee working closely with school officials. There won't be any courtesy calls on the president of American University either. That job became suddenly vacant when police traced obscene phone calls to the president's office. He followed the now standard protocol. Resignation, apology, talk show appearance. This is the scandal tour bus. We are indebted to the city for providing us with so much scandal. At $30 a head, busloads of tourists now prowl the capital's sleaze geography. It's unlikely the State Department will want Gorbachev on this tour. Anyhow, it's booked full. It's the Vista Hotel, where Marion Barry, mayor of Washington, was busted, arrested. There it is, Watergate! The tour has reminders that infamy in high places is nothing new, from Watergate... Let's put that in there. ...to memories of Abscam where the FBI shot 1980's top home video, Congressmen stuffed pockets with big bills. Another tour stop is the Gary Hart townhouse. No picking through the garbage for mementos, all right? What is especially sad about this year's scandals is that they involve not conniving politicians from far away, but local heroes, badly needed role models for Washington's kids, especially those trapped in high crime neighborhoods. And it's used as a rationalization by those who sell drugs and use drugs that everybody's doing it, even the mayor is doing it. It is a, like an acid on the, the armor, moral armor of those kids and adults who don't want to be involved in criminal activity. Just what is it with this city anyway? It's a question many people have been asking as the civic muck piles up. The guess is, as always in this capital city, that it has something to do with power and the kind of people who chase it. This is a town that's uh, power driven. It's power driven and they've got a lot of people who figure they're important, kind of uh, above the way the rest of us should behave, above morality, above law. But you know, the funny thing is that with all these high powered people, what happens is they stumble, they do silly things. So, welcome to Washington, President Gorbachev. There's plenty to see here, including the most breathtaking sight of all, the mighty falling. Eric Engberg in Washington for CBS This Morning. And it's five minutes before the hour right now. We'll have more of our summit coverage from Washington when we come back. In Bush administration, John Poindexter was sentenced today. Prison time, six months.
no fine. This was for five felony convictions stemming from the secret dealing of U.S. missiles to Ayatollah Khomeini. Poindexter could have received up to 25 years and more than $1 million in fines. Eric Ingberg reports. John Poindexter, one of the most important men in government under President Reagan, today became the first person sentenced to prison for Iran-Contra crimes. Judge Harold Green ordered him to serve six months for five felonies the judge said undermined the constitutional principles of the country. Prosecutors applauded the decision to impose jail time. Jail sentences are clearly a deterrent impact and pass a strong message on to public officials that when you serve in high government office with that responsibility, that you must do so at the highest levels of integrity and honesty. Poindexter refused comment. He will remain free while his lawyers work on an appeal. We have heard the court sentencing today, and we intend to take this case under appeal. In court, Beckler sought leniency on the grounds of his client's long service to the country. Prosecutor Webb responded that the crimes were a sustained, prolonged effort to obstruct Congress and asserted any sign of contrition from Poindexter was conspicuously absent. Poindexter showed no emotion as Judge Green gave him a civics lesson. Green said Poindexter had no standing in a democratic society to invalidate the decisions of elected officials in Congress. The judge imposed no fine while handing out the six-month prison term. It's not a light sentence. Admiral Poindexter is not a common criminal. Uh, I don't think a heavy sentence is appropriate here. On the other hand, you just can't overlook the seriousness of what he did in misleading lying to the Congress uh, and obfuscating the record. Poindexter backers are agitating for a presidential pardon, but White House spokesman today refused even to discuss that issue, loaded with political dynamite, until all appeals have been decided. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Washington. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled today that the new federal law passed by Congress against populous province might actually break away from the rest of the country is being taken more seriously than ever tonight after efforts to amend the Canadian Constitution more to Quebec's liking fell through last night. Eric Ingberg has been following the story all week and has the latest from Montreal. The party weekend Montreal had planned to honor a French Canadian saint has now taken on a French nationalist flavor the wake of last night's defeat of constitutional changes giving the province of Quebec special powers to protect its French heritage. The law sent tremors across the normally placid Canadian political landscape. With the Canadian dollar already falling because of the crisis, Prime Minister Brian Mulroney today took to the airways to try to assure world markets Canada remains a safe investment. To our friends and partners abroad, I urge that this situation be kept in perspective. Canadians have always overcome challenges to our unity, and we shall do so again. But this morning, the fleur-de-lis was waving in neighborhoods across Montreal, affirmation in blue and white of widespread fears that Quebec separatism is gaining steam. Oh, I think the heart of Quebec is very much in the sense of uh, enough is enough. We want to be ourselves. In the cafes and streets of the city's many French districts, People spoke approvingly of making the leap to forming their own country. Quebec will slowly but surely and calmly, hopefully, uh, move uh, towards uh, independence. Because we have a, a different culture, we speak in French, we are different. Quebec Premier Robert Bourassa, a moderate who worked for the failed constitutional deal, Reader, said today the province will not go back to the bargaining table. But his remarks were free of inflammatory rhetoric and just played up the need for caution to protect the economy. That the Premier of Quebec in no way will take any decision affecting the economic security of Quebecers. The ordeal has left Canada exhausted. Prime Minister Mulroney, who appeared two weeks ago to be on the verge of an historic breakthrough in settling English-French grievances, is so seriously weakened commentators now speculate he could be booted from power. And while everyone is predicting no sudden moves to break up the country, Quebec and the rest of Canada are now more alienated than at any time in 20 years. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Montreal. The
Canada, an accord intended to declare Quebec a distinct society has fallen apart, and now some people are worrying again about Canada falling apart. We find Eric Engberg in Montreal this morning. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Charles. You know, uh, the pr premier of one of the Canadian provinces, Frank McKenna, said a couple of days ago that uh, this country of Canada is now crawling with American television reporters, and the reason for it is is that no country has ever torn itself apart without a shot being fired before. I guess I'll have to plead guilty as one of the television reporters. Uh, that is the kind of cataclysmic language that tended to infect the debate over uh, changing the Canadian Constitution in the final days of the debate. Then when it lost in two legislatures, it was interesting to watch yesterday as the federal government, the central government of Brian Mulroney and the Quebec government tried to talk about how it's the crisis isn't that serious and everybody should relax and cool off a little bit. Premier Robert Barassa of Quebec uh, making an appeal to Canadian citizens to not think in terms of the country falling apart, but I thought more significantly making a direct appeal to Wall Street in the United States saying don't think American investors, don't think that things are so bad here that you have to pull your money out of Canada. So that is the kind of serious financial ramifications that they're concerned about in yeah. the wake of the defeat of this accord. Um, Brian Mulroney sounded so sad when he announced that after three years of struggling with this thing, it had fallen apart. Uh, he may say that uh, there, there really isn't a crisis, but from this side of the border, it looks as if there is. Well, and, I, and, and Mulroney's government played up the crisis talk during the period they were trying to press this agreement through. Uh, the government itself uh, talked about the possibility of Quebec splitting apart from the rest of Canada. So it, Mulroney is now in one of those as you sow, social you reap situations. Uh, as one Canadian commentator said to me, you know, these guys talked about a crisis so much that they ended up having one. Uh, what most Canadians will tell you, and, I, and I've talked to uh, a lot of them here in Quebec, is that there is a new mood here in Quebec that was gaining strength anyway, and that is that this province could go it alone if it had to. We could, we could be a successful nation, or we could enter into some kind of a new agreement with Canada whereby we could protect our French heritage, uh, and we wouldn't have to answer to the rest of Canada on language issues, on cultural issues, and we are economically prosperous enough now. There's a this sort of new generation of uh, French-Canadian businessmen who feel uh, confident in their ability to manage an economy, who feel confident enough in their relationships with the United States, they think that they could sell and buy and, and establish markets with the United States, that Quebec could stand alone. Now, the question will be, over the next couple of years, this is not something that's going to play out overnight, will the politicians in uh, French Canada start moving toward putting issues before the voters? Yeah. that would allow uh, Quebec to break well, away. Well, now, the Canadians are always complaining that Americans don't pay enough attention to what goes on north of the border, and so I may be confused in my memory about this, yeah. but I thought about 10 years ago, Quebec voted on the question that's, of secession and, and voted it down overwhelmingly. And, and voted it down. There was a government in power here, the Parti Québécois, which ran on a platform of separating Quebec from Canada. It put the issue to the voters, the voters voted it down. However, in the, in the 10 years since that happened, and you're right on the money, Charles, on your Canadian history, and in the, t in the 10 years since that happened, there has been this development of a, of a French-Canadian business ethic, a much stronger uh, success ratio among French businesses here. And I think also the country has just gotten tired of the issue. That was the impression I had as I went to Newfoundland and as I, as I came back here to Montreal, that people uh, are tired of these regional divisions and of arguing over the, the question yeah. of Quebec. And finally, I think Quebec uh, uh, residents are saying maybe we would be better off alone. The hope for avoiding that kind of, of separation uh, lies in time and time healing some of these